Hello and welcome. I'm Christy Wake from the Center for Faculty Excellence, and this is Research Literacy, the tool for promoting positive social change in the disinformation age. This presentation is part of the 2020 Research Conference being promoted by the Center for Research Quality. Our presenter today is Dr. Omar Clay. He is the Research Director for Science for the People and also contributing faculty at the Center for Undergraduate Studies here at Walden University. Omar's research background includes work in global security and science education. For the last decade, he's been involved in environmental research in Baja, California. He's worked with low-cost technologies for bringing clean water to water-impoverished developing world communities. He has also studied nuclear and biological weapons technologies and policies. Omar sees an important link between social progress and science literacy and regularly speaks publicly to inform and inspire people to act on important science and related challenges. So without further ado, I'd like to hand things over to our plenary speaker, Dr. Omar Clay. Thanks so much for that introduction, Christy. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and I'm glad to be here with everybody. Um, as Christy pointed out, I, I really want to get everyone here thinking about the connections between science literacy, which I'm going to lump together with research and information literacy, and its connection to social change. And, uh, and I'll be more specific and focus on global security and prosperity because that's kind of where I came from. Uh, and to start with, I wanted to share some results uh, that maybe fly in the face of what people think about with science courses. These are the results from some uh, from the science courses I taught last year. And in, in those classes, 73% of the students strongly agreed that the course helped them understand how to contribute to positive social change, with most of the rest of the students agreeing with that. So this is kind of unusual. It's not what people usually think about with, uh, with science courses. And so it's a good way to start this, this uh, little talk. And uh, unfortunately, uh, a sobering statistic to start with is that 93 to 97% of uh, American adults are considered effectively scientifically literate. And this has been stable for decades. Uh, so what is science literacy? And it's, it, here's one definition. I've broken it into uh, uh, parts. But it, can, you know, it consists of some understanding of scientific findings and conclusions. But in particular, it also focuses on science, uh, understanding scientific process and how to, how to critically evaluate information and how to critically evaluate scientific information in particular. I've, I've pulled out two things that I wanna focus on in this talk. The first is what we call civic science literacy. And this is that, that literacy that's related to scientific issues that are relevant to the, to the um, contemporary affairs, to governance, both on the international, national and on and the local levels. And then the other aspect of science literacy that I want to talk to you about is, is really closely related to information and research literacy. And this is the ability to critically evaluate the quality of information on its, based on its source and the methods used to generate it. Uh, when it comes to content knowledge, uh, Americans are, are very, very middle of the road. Uh, compare international, internationally, our comparisons are just below or just above average, a ranking out of 38 out of 71 is very common when we do these types of studies. Um, but there is a way that, uh, a, a metric in which, which Americans have really improved uh, recently. And, th and this is the civic science literacy that I was referring to uh, earlier. And it looks like, according to the work of Miller et al., that a, a major reason for this improvement in civic science literacy really has to do with the number of science courses people take in college. And since most people are not going into the sciences, this has is probably closely connected to the liberal arts re colleges requiring that one science course for their degree. And as you, as you might expect, as civic science literacy has increased in our country, that means our, you know, the people's understanding of important subjects facing our country have has also improved. Uh, at this point, climate literacy has really increased in the United States, though I hasten to add that 16% of Americans continue to think that global warming is not actually happening. And as, as Americans become more aware of these types of subjects, they become, uh, for instance, here, as we can see with the data, they're, they're more aware of potential harms, in particular associated with climate change here. 
And we're also, as we as we become more aware of climate change and climate change uh, as as a, a detrimental effect on ourselves and in our, our environment, people are also beginning to prioritize uh, climate uh, climate policies. So we're seeing that across the country as well, and this puts the United States in closer a uh, closer connection with what we're seeing internationally. But where, uh, where Americans continue to really have trouble with regards to science literacy is our understanding of the process, and to some extent, even the motivation of scientific inquiry. A good example of that is this study here that found that 49% of Americans are unable to explain the rationale for the use of control group in an experiment. That means if, if we're testing a new drug almost half of Americans can't explain why we would want to have one group where we test the new drug and another group where we don't in order for a com to compare them. So th this is a fundamental to the scientific process and, and something that obviously we're having trouble with in the United States. So, so what is it that uh, Americans are missing really about science? And here I know this is a um, relatively elite group. Uh, people here are, are research literate, but um, so bear with me, but I just want to to, to delve into this briefly. Um, in science, we're, we're really looking to test our ideas. And the reason for that is that we're looking for flaws. We want to find the flaws in our ideas so that we can improve our understanding of the phenomenon that we have ideas about. And the way that we do that is that we take our ideas and we compare the predictions from those ideas to experimental or observational data. And a, a common misconception is that uh, scientists are really out to prove their ideas right. But the reality is that in science, we're much more, what we do is much closer to looking to try to disprove our ideas. We're really trying to test them. And then scientific understanding will progress as we discard ideas that cannot account for the data. And, and so that's the way that, that the scientists actually are trying to approximate truth uh, over the long run. In fact, the, the concept of testing ideas is so critical to science that this is really the first test of, a of an idea is, is it a scientific idea? In order for an idea to compete in the arena of science, it must be testable and it must be falsifiable. That is, there must be some result of a test that would demonstrate your idea to be false. So this falsifi falsifiability is, is a key aspect of what it means to have a scientific hypothesis. And again, you see uh, with this process how Science is really not out to prove things. We're out to verify or confirm predictions or disprove ideas altogether. And, and in this way, uh, science literacy is, is very closely connected to both information literacy and research literacy, which I've already asserted a couple of times. And it's really this essence of this, this focus on critically evaluating uh, information and, uh, and where information comes from. Uh, and one of the statistics that, that touches on this within the context of, the, of American uh, populace is that 75% of, of American eighth graders who are considered to be very computer literate really are not able to distinguish the reliability of web-based information or independently use computers as to tools. So the essence of, of this, this, that I'm, I'm, this essence of this little uh, bit of argumentation I'm trying to present to you is, is that in the scientific approach, essentially we, ha we have an idea and then we go out and we try to find evidence to falsify our idea. And if we fail to falsify our idea, well, maybe we have a good one. Um, and if we do falsify our idea, good. Now we, we can discard it or modify it and start again. Whereas what we see in popular cognition is typically if you have an idea, people will go out and try to find evidence to support their idea. And uh, they may accumulate a small amount of information that supports their idea, but they may not even pay any attention to information that contradicts their idea. And so this is a, this is, it's a logical fallacy. So scientific skepticism is, is, it really requires that we critically and honest, honestly evaluate the ideas of others, but notably ourselves as well. So notice how different this is from being contrarian or reactionary. And in order to test our understanding of this concept of falsification, let's consider the, this waste and application. And I'm sure some of you have seen this before, um, but, but if not, here, here's the general layout. We have, uh, some cards in front of us. Each card has a number on one side and it has a color on the other side. The color on the other side of the card is either red or it's orange. And we've been provided with this hypothesis. If a card shows an even number on one, side, on one face, then its opposite face is red. That's our hypothesis. And so the question I have for you all is which card or cards must be turned over in order to test the following idea. So how do we test this idea? 
and I'm just going to walk through the cards and, um, and uh, I ask you to raise your hand if you think that we should flip it over and then I'll, I'll evaluate that card and we'll move on to the next card and I'll ask everybody again. And hopefully by the end of it, uh, everybody will be getting this, this, uh, this correct. So number three, who thinks we should flip that over? And just a few people think we should flip over the number three. And, and you can see why if we flip over the three and we find a red face, we really haven't actually falsified our hypothesis because the three is an odd number. Our hypothesis is about even numbers. So our hypothesis actually doesn't have anything to say about that three. Whether there's a red or an orange on the other side doesn't really matter. So we don't need to flip over the three. How, how about the eight? Who thinks we should throw, flip over the eight? And uh, almost everybody wants to flip over the eight and that makes good sense because there's our hypothesis. It says if a card shows an even number on one side and we have an even number, we better have red on the other side. So if we flip that eight over and we find an orange, we've falsified our hypothesis and, uh, <clears throat> and disproven it. And if we find that it's red on the other side, then that, that supports our hypothesis. Notice it doesn't prove our hypothesis. It simply supports it. So we do want to flip over the eight. How about that red? And uh, a lot of people want to flip over the red too. And, and that makes some sense. But, but think about what happens when we flip over the red. We either find an even or an odd number. If we find an odd number, again, it had nothing to do with our hypothesis, so it's irrelevant. But if we find an even number, it again, it confirms our hypothesis, it supports it, but it doesn't prove it. it it's not a test. Flipping over the red can, is what you would do if you're looking to support your hypothesis, but it's not what you do if you were looking to test your hypothesis. How about that orange? And now everybody knows we wanna flip over that orange, right? Because if on the other side of that orange card, we find an even number, we've disproven our hypothesis. So that's a real legitimate test. If we find an odd number, again, it has nothing to do with our hypothesis. So that, this is the essence of, of really testing your own ideas and, and testing ideas uh, to look to see if you can find a flaw in them and then improve them. So I'm gonna go back to this issue of social change and, and, uh, and global security. And, and I'm gonna start with some observations. Common thread in, in, in the threats to global security and prosperity, and here I've, I have some background with both nuclear weapons and biological weapons, but also with environmental challenges. A common thread in these threats is a lack of scientifically sound policies, either on a national or an international level or on both. And I think a, a corollary to what we saw earlier with science literacy in the United States anyway, is that along with the public, many, perhaps most policymakers are not scientifically literate. So a couple claims. One is that to improve global security and prosperity and make positive social change, we need to improve science literacy amongst our policymakers. And then the corollary there is in democratic republics, such as the US, this would require improving science literacy amongst the general public. And that's a claim and it's open to, to discussion uh, and you guys may disagree with me on that. So that brings us to a really uh, another unique aspect of our meeting today, and that's this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and, that, and this has really challenged all of us. Um, and in that regard, I wanna congratulate and, uh, and say thanks to the organizers for putting on this virtual conference. And I also want to uh, extend our thanks to uh, the essential workers that are keeping our society and our economy floating. Um, and in spite of what we've heard from some of our leaders, um, infectious diseases and pandemics are not only not new, but we've been predicting this one for some time and uh, we are continuing to predict more uh, infectious diseases and pandemics in the future. And the reason for that, or there's several, but uh, two of the big ones, the first one is climate change. As, as the temperatures warm, uh, planetary temperature warms, vec disease spreading vectors, things like mosquitoes, ticks, rodents, bats, have, uh, they're gonna be active for a long, uh, greater number of months uh, throughout the year. And they're gonna be able to reach geographical areas and therefore human populations that they haven't actually been in contact with before. And in this way, they will spread disease. And then another way that we're gonna see, or another reason we're gonna see uh, uh, increasing risk of pandemics and infectious disease in the future is that, uh, humanity is continuing to encroach on wild areas. And so as we infringe on what was previously a wild area, we put ourselves and our domestic animal life in ever closer contact with wildlife. And so this increases the likelihood of having a disease or a pathogen uh, moving from the wild population to a, to a human population. And so here I, I've talked a little bit about some of these environmental challenges and I'm gonna take a little side and there's a science literacy aside with regards to global security issue. And I'm gonna start with uh, the water crisis and, and 
many of you may not realize, we have a global water crisis. Uh, and, and in this graph, I think you can see in black, that's the human population curve. It's gone up by 400% since 1900. But in the bar graph, you can see water consumption. It has grown up, grown by about 1500%, which is 350% faster than our population. So we're not only consuming, there's not only many more of us consuming water, but we're consuming water much more, we're consuming much more water per capita than we were in 1900. And, and although this is a, a water planet, you know, you would think maybe we could never run out of water. The vast bulk of water, in the, in, in the global oceans and what, you know, maybe two to two and a half percent of fresh water on the planet. And of that, most of it's locked up in the, the glaciers and the ice caps uh, at the poles. So what little bit of liquid fresh water exists, uh, there is either in a surface water body or it's underground, a lot of it's underground. And so that's where we get our water, the water that we drink. And when we pull water out of these underground, underground reservoirs or aquifers, and we do so at a rate that exceeds the recharge rate of the aquifer, the water table will drop in the aquifer. And, and that's actually what we're seeing. Uh, so if you look here in Southwest throughout the United States, uh, water, level, water levels have dropped 50, 100, 200 feet in the last century. Similarly, throughout the country, uh, and there you can see on the right-hand side is Chicago, 800 foot drop in the water table since 1864. Uh, and these are just examples being pulled from the USGS. There's, this is not unique to the United States. So essentially what, what's happening is you see these water tables drop is that we are depleting aquifers. So these are the biggest aquifer, aquifers in the United States. And you can see that with, with a few exceptions in the Northwest, uh, there's been tens to hundreds of kilometers, cubic kilometers of water uh, pulled out of these aquifers in the last century. It's, it's a tremendous uh, drain of, of water that, that we ha are representing here. And so uh, th this, this is hearkening to our future, even though it's our present, because there's still water in these reservoirs, but there won't be forever. And unfortunately, the United States is just not all that unique in this regard. This is going on around the world. Uh, we're, we're over drying water everywhere. And that's part of the reason we're seeing the loss of surface water bodies around the world. For instance, here is Lake Chad. This used to be the largest uh, freshwater body in Africa. Um, it's now hardly a lake at all. And again, the Aral Sea. The Aral Sea has had uh, most of its water diverted for agricultural purposes, and a few would call it a, a sea at this point. And of course, we're also trashing our water supply, uh, not only with literal macroscopic trash or, or microplastics, but also with fertilizers and pesticides. And moving now to, a, to another large reservoir, a global reservoir that we are polluting, that is our atmosphere. So uh, we now have a global air quality crisis. This is just 45 years of data of three different uh, air pollutants. Uh, these happen to be greenhouse gases. And in the last 45 years, each one of these has increased its, its concentration in our global atmosphere by over 10%. This is all due to human emissions. And because these are greenhouse gases, they are responsible for global warming. And the way the greenhouse effect works is as we pollute the atmosphere with greenhouse gases, those gases will trap heat on the planet that would otherwise have escaped out to space. The planet's warm, it radiates infrared radiation. And without greenhouse gases, a lot of that infrared radiation gets out to space space and cools the planet. But uh, with the greenhouse gases, it traps that heat on the planet. And so that's why we're seeing temperatures rise. Unfortunately, that's not the, the, you know, the end uh, of uh, air pollution. Uh, air quality has, you know, uh, polluted air has dramatic health impacts, especially for young people. 93% um, of children are estimated to be living in, in, in air polluted environments. Um, in 2016, over a half a billion children under the age of five died of respiratory uh, infections that were related to air pollution. And unfortunately, air quality is not just a, a problem for children, though that alone would have been enough of a problem. More than one out of three people worldwide at risk of ill health, according to this study, a uh, more recent study, nearly half of Americans are breathing unhealthy air. And this is a record-breaking pollution recently. In fact, if you look at the United States as airspace relative to other airspaces around the world, you'll see that we don't have particularly great air quality. This is actually somewhat new and it's related to changes that uh, were made in the EPA under the current administration. So you can see that in just the last couple of years, uh, there's been a 20% increase in particulate matter. For instance, in the US airspace, particulate matter has dramatic impacts on, on mental health and then physiological health. So this is, this is by no means innocuous. 
And then finally, I'll lead off with uh, leave off uh, our little science literacy uh, global security aside with another real challenge, which is extinction. Um, at this point, uh, humans have initiated what's called the sixth mass extinction in our, in our history. That, I mean, and when I say our history, I mean the history of our planet. Um, and as you can see in this graph, the little dotted line there is the background extinction rate. That's what you would expect without human activities. And with human activities, you can see that we've really accelerated the extinction of every class of animal life. So that's the end of our, our science aside, our, our science literacy, global security aside. But uh, when you become a political leader or the president, you're not gonna be surprised that we're facing a global water crisis or a global air quality crisis, or a human caused mass extinction, or I probably should have put on here another pandemic either because all of these things are in the cards. We expect those things at this point. So back to this pandemic issue, um, how, how are we doing? And as you can see, this is data that was retrieved on the 26th um, and all this data incident is available online uh, without special university library access or anything else. Every bit of data that I'm sharing in this in presentation can be found uh, by anybody that has access to the internet. Unfortunately, you can see that the United States has not been doing particularly well. This is essentially per capita uh, infection rates and we're quite high relative to our European ca uh, um, counterparts and uh, perhaps globally as well, though it's much harder to, to make that assertion because we don't have great testing globally. And uh, U.S. is really unique in this. Uh, on the, on the uh, right-hand half of this graph, we can see nations that have high GDP per capita, and I kind of put a green sh shading there. And the upper half of the graph, I put a pink shading to, to show those countries that have high infection rates, per capita infection rates. And you can see the United States is quite unique in, in that it's in both categories. It's both wealthy and has high infection rate. And this is the real tragic uh, implication of that, which is, and in, in here in yellow, you can see the, the, the per capita death rate in the United States. And it continues to be one of the highest in the world as, as our, our infection rates and our death rates are much higher and continue to lag behind some of our European counterparts. And of course, you know, a major question here is why? Why are we doing so poorly as a country? Uh, one of the ways of trying to understand uh, how government policy is, is being implemented is this uh, Oxford stringency response index. This is an index that really just looks at how uh, strict a government was in its, in its um, response to the pandemic. It's, it's not meant to say it did a good job or a bad job, it's just strictness. And here you can see one of the types of policy responses that uh, the, the Oxford looks at for this stringency response index, uh, which is contact tracing. And <clears throat> contract tracing, for those that don't know, uh, is, is really when, when somebody is found to be infected, newly infected with, with COVID-19, or uh, they, the um, medical professionals would then ask for a list of people that that person has been around near recently, and then contact all of those people to give them a heads up that they now need to get tested. And this is really how you get ahead of a pandemic, is through contact tracing. This is a really key aspect of it. And as you can see here, at least according to Oxford, Oxford, the United States is, is doing a very poor job uh, relative to the rest of the world with regards to contact tracing. Now, is the reason that we, you know, is, is this poor policy response or is that the reason that we have these high infection rates and, and death rates? Uh, it's not clear. There's been some preliminary studies. Uh, this one here concludes rather dramatically that the U.S. would have suffered 70 to 99 percent fewer coronavirus just a stricter uh, um, policy response early on. Again, this is very preliminary, I think even by the author's estimation. And here's yet another uh, very preliminary analysis, which comes to similar conclusions, a little less dramatic. They're just saying a substantial number of cases and deaths could have been averted. But regardless of whether it's a poor policy response or not, I think the question of whether science literacy is a, is a key fundamental problem here re remains live. This is a live problem, a, a, a live question. Um, so one way to get at science literacy in the population versus you know, in, in policymakers or amongst political leaders is to look at things like you know, who's wearing masks. Here you can see in yellow, uh, highlight, uh, you know, United States, this is a self-report. This is just the number of Americans claiming to wear masks in public. Again, you can see where I got the data and what date there on the lower right. 
And uh, although Americans are doing much better than some countries and not nearly as good as some others, uh, still one out of four Americans say they don't wear a mask in public. So for me, this was a little confusing as a scientist. Um, the, the mechanistic model of disease transmission is something that's been around for over a century. You know, uh, uh, this, you know, just understanding the disease is transmitted in a very mechanistic way from little, little part, particles that go from one person into another person. And this supports the use of masks and social distancing and both as a way to protect oneself, but also one's community from the spread of disease. And this is something that's been practiced, as I mentioned, for over a century. But I um, was probably overly optimistic. Uh, and it seems like maybe a mechanistic view of disease transmission is not so accessible or so commonplace. And part of the reason that, that we might think that that's the case is because of these other science literacy statistics. We find out that less than half of Americans know that antibiotics do not kill viruses. Um, uh, no, or not, no, not less than half, I'm sorry. It's 55% of Americans know that. Um, about a quarter of Americans cannot identify the definition of an incubation period. Almost half of Americans can't provide an acceptable definition of DNA. So these types of, of statistics suggest that it's possible that Americans, for instance, don't know the difference between a virus and a bacteria. Uh, bacteria are, are cell-based uh, life forms. They, they have uh, genetic material inside of them, but they also have a metabolism and they exchange nutrients and wastes with the, with the outside world through their cell membrane, just like our own cells do. And in fact, we ourselves are largely bacterial in, in, in composition. We depend on all kinds of symbiotic bacteria in our, in our guts and in our orifices and on our skin and so on and so forth. Whereas, whereas Viruses, on the other hand, are simply little tiny bits of genetic material in, in, encapsulated in protein, and they do nothing until they come in contact with a cell membrane, and then they inject their genetic material into that cell and will hijack the cell's uh, machinery, uh, ultimately destroying the cell while they create many more viruses in the process. So even if you didn't know anything, though, about uh, a mechanistic model of disease transmission, you didn't know any scientific facts, if you, under, if you had research literacy, if you knew how to look things up, you would be able to easily figure out whether you should wear a mask or not. There's all kinds of studies available, really good solid studies online. Uh, so some of these studies even allow you to, to compare different types of masks and uh, the efficacy of these masks as long, as long with uh, obviously the costs. Uh, similarly with social distancing, the studies have been done, they're available for people that are interested. Um, some of these studies maybe weren't done or weren't available right at the very beginning of this pandemic, but they've been around for a little while now. So anybody, even if you didn't know <clears throat> much about science, you could easily find out what would be appropriate health uh, measures to take in the face of a pandemic if you just have research literacy, the, the skills necessary to look things up. So get back to, a, or actually I'm going to transition back to another global security issue, uh, and this is climate change. And I'm, I'm going to pull out these, they're, they, they self-identify as uh, science or climate science skeptics, but I'm going to have to call them climate science denialists because I don't believe that they are skeptics in the, uh, in the, in the scientific sense. Um, and I'll explain what I mean by that. But in particular, I, I mean, I don't believe that these, what I'm going to call science, uh, climate change denialists, honestly examine and test the ideas of others and themselves. And I'm not sure that they're open to improving their understanding of the world with new data and observations, though I'd like to think that they are and they just need a little bit of help. So let's, let's consider how a legitimate skeptic would, who doesn't know science but has research literacy skills would approach the idea that global warming is a hoax. This is something we've heard from the sitting president. Global warming is a hoax. Well, what if you, you know, how would somebody know? Um, Firstly, if, if somebody goes to set out to prove that global warming is a hoax, that person is going to find lots of well-funded websites to support the idea that it is a hoax. I mean, that's, a lot of those websites are, have funding from um, fossil fuel industry, and, and research uh, indicates that even now uh, some of them are continuing to get um, funding from, from fossil fuel industry. However, none of those websites that, that, that support the notion that global warming is a hoax is going to be from a reputable scientific body. And few, if any of them, will have a .edu or a .gov in their URL. So that research literacy would really help somebody distinguish whether those were decent websites or not. So let's, let's go on and consider some of the other things that, that a uh, global warming denialist might say. First of all, global warming is a hoax. Okay, our temperature is rising. 
that's easy to find out. You look it up. Uh, land temperatures are going up. Ocean uh, temperatures are going up. So it seems like the, the planet's warming. Another good way to look at this are, is just the, the uh, hottest years on record. We have over a century of, of temperature data on the planet. The nine hottest years on record occurred in the last 10 years. So that should be pretty shocking for people. Uh, it's definitely getting warmer. An even more honest way to really look at this is to look at a decadal average of, of the average global temperature because uh, remember, climate is really weather that's averaged over almost uh, about a decade, really. That's a, about what climate is. So when we look at our average temperature every decade for the last century or so, we can see that the planet's obviously warming. A, an interesting thing that I've heard from students one, once in a while is the reason they know global warming is a hoax isn't because of the temperature data, but it's because we now call it climate change. And, and though I don't fully understand how this reasoning works, I do want to point out that uh, global warming is just one component of climate change. Yes, the oceans are warming, the land is warming, the atmosphere is warming, but climate change is also referring to the change in the chemical composition of our atmosphere and the change in the chemical composition of our oceans, for instance. Our oceans, as, as more CO2 enters our atmosphere, more of it uh, permeates into the ocean where, where it forms carbonic acid, and that decreases the sea surface pH, which you can see in the lower left there. So the ocean is actually getting acidic, which is causing real problems for uh, marine uh, ecosystems. Uh, another common idea is that, well, okay, the planet's warming, but it's because the sun is getting stronger. Now that on, on the face of it, it's not a bad idea. The sun is actually a very dynamic entity. Of course, we have to look at what kind of energy is coming from the sun. It could drive the climate change conceivably. Uh, uh, and you can see the dynamic nature of the sun there in the graph on the right-hand side. That's the energy coming from the sun. The sun has a 12 year, uh, 11 year cycle or 22, if you wanna be really honest about it, but it doesn't matter. You can see that cycle go up and down. And you can see in the yellow, the average amount of energy is slowly going down. It won't go down forever. It just so happens to be in a phase like that. But clearly the sun is not driving climate change today. Another uh, common uh, uh, misconception is, well, okay, maybe the planet's warming, but it's just a natural cycle. Well, this is, there are definitely natural cycles or really important natural cycles in, in our climate system. Uh, you can see most of these there on the right-hand side. These are the millennials. Yankovic cycles first discovered in the 1930s by Serbian physicists. You can notice that the time scale for most of these things is 10 to hundreds of thousands of years long. Um, and, and we know that none of these have, uh, are, none of these are really driving climate change today because we include them in all of our models. So here in, in the black line in the graph, you can see the global average temperature again. And in, in the green shade, you can see the models being run without including human terms. So this is just a natural climate cycle. And you can see that the temperature, if anything, would be going down just a little bit from these natural cycles. But when we include the human factors, uh, we get the blue shade, uh, we can account for the increase in global average temperatures. And in spite of the fact, in spite of what I just showed you, which I think is pretty good evidence already that, we, that our models are pretty decent, uh, it's a really common thing to say, well, scientific models of climate are not accurate. And, and that's a really fair Thing to ask because the climate system is complex. You know, do we understand enough about it to model it at all? And certainly there's lots more that we need to learn to, to do a really, really accurate job. But we have pretty accurate models. And I think that this, that's best uh, illustrated by going all the way back to 1988, which was one of the first uh, climate models ever, um, uh, ever um, published by Dr. James Hansen. And here you can see, and I've bold faced in blue, you know, uh, on the, the right hand side of the graph, all of his projections. He published this in, in 1988. Those are proje projections are uh, scenario A, B, and C. And then in yellow and black, you can see the actual global average temperature again. And his projection is, it, he's broken them up into scenario A, B, and C because he's considered different emission scenarios. In scenario A, he imagines that humans really doubled down on greenhouse gas emissions and started putting out even more. In scenario B, he essentially assumed business as usual, which is basically what we did. And then scenario C is uh, humans really cut back on greenhouse emissions. And so this, this model was, was, was uh, published in 1988. It's been 30 years. And you can see that, uh, that the current temperature is really close to what would be predicted from scenario B. So I would say that we have pretty accurate models. And I'm quite impressed by the fact that Hansen was able to do this with the very crude computer technology that existed in the, in the late 80s. 
Uh, another thing that uh, the, the uh, climate change denialists will say is that humans simply cannot change the composition of the atmosphere. It's just too big or something. And I've already shown you some data to the effect that that's not true. And here's some more of it. You can, these are three major greenhouse gases going back for 2000 years. And the way we can go back so far into, into our atmosphere concentration is by collecting little gas bubbles that were trapped in ice cores in, in, the, in the poles. And so we've actually gone back further than this, it's, it's back, I think all the way back to 2 million years now, but this is 800,000 years of data that you're looking at here. In red, you can see the atmosphere, uh, the, the temperature of the atmosphere, uh, and you can see almost 100,000 year cycles. That's those uh, Milankovitch cycles that we mentioned earlier, those natural cycles. In blue, you can see the atmospheric CO2. And in the upper right of the uh, graph, you can see what atmospheric CO2 was like in 2017, and it's only gotten higher since then. We are in uncharted territory with regards to uh, our climate system today. Finally, this is uh, the last slide, and this isn't really so much for climate change denialists, but some, some, sometimes I'll encounter people who say, well, okay, this is happening, but there's nothing I can do about it. And beyond making sure that we elect uh, leaders and, and political policy, uh, policymakers who really do understand how important this, these threats are, uh, there's a whole bunch of things that we all do that impacts our climate system and impacts our, our planet uh, broadly. And again, just you get online and look it up and you're, you'll be able to find, if you, if you have research literacy, all kinds of ways that you might be able to improve your climate or carbon footprint. And with that, I wanna thank you for your attention.